2023 is off to an interesting start and the time has finally arrived for us to go in depth on the new Razer Edge, which officially launched on January 26th. Razer is certainly no stranger to creating mobile devices with a gaming focus and the Razer Edge is a package that has a lot to prove with an interesting form factor that focuses in on a phone-like device without the phone features. With its Snapdragon G3X Gen 1 and the updated Kishi V2 Pro, the Razer Edge is ready to take on the Android handheld gaming space. So is the Razer Edge the ultimate Android gaming handheld, or does it simply find itself too dull to compete? Join me, the Retro Tech Dad, as we explore Razer's latest piece of mobile technology. I highly recommend grabbing a sub from your favorite joint, as this will be a long one. First up, let's talk the specs. The Razer Edge comes with a large 6.8 inch 144Hz AMOLED display at 2400 by 1080 resolution. It is powered by the Qualcomm Snapdragon G3X Gen 1 SoC and includes 8 gigs of, oh, nope, just kidding, 6 gigs of LP DDR5 RAM for the Wi Fi model and 8 gigs of LP DDR5 RAM for the 5G model. Both versions include 128GB of UFS 3.1 internal storage and is expandable up to 2TB with a microSD card. The Razer Edge is equipped with Wi-Fi 6E, Bluetooth 5.2 and uses USB Type-C for power delivery, data and video out. It includes a 5000 mAh battery and Android 12 out of the box. Both versions come with a new Razer Kishi version 2 Pro with new additions like a 3.5mm headphone jack and built-in haptics. At the time of publishing, the device is only available for sale in the United States with the 5G version sold exclusively through Verizon. The Wi-Fi model comes in at $399 US dollars and the 5G model is $599 US dollars with Verizon offering promotional discounts. Alright, it's now time to get this thing unboxed. We got some very crunchy paper here. Don't think it's doing a whole lot to protect the package, so let's just tear this thing off. Okay, much better. Looks like the Razer Edge to me. The front of the box very clearly shows its inclusion of the Snapdragon G3X Gen 1 console class controls and that 6.8 inch 144Hz AMOLED. It looks like we get a 2 year warranty on the Edge and a 1 year warranty for the Kishi V2 Pro. Some dimensions, weight, and a little teaser of what's in the package. Nothing too interesting here, now the backside, which proudly declares the Razer Edge as the ultimate gaming handheld for Android. Here's the side and then the top of the box. Okay, time to take these seals off, no knife action this time around. There we go, looks like I've got some more seals to take care of. Just wanted to point out that the entire packaging is printed with soy. I wonder if it tastes good. Let's put the edge aside for a moment and dive further into this box. Yay for trays! For gamers, by gamers. And here's the inside of the included instructions sheet. A little poem from the CEO of Razer and some standard instructions. I'll tell you, my sticker collection is getting pretty substantial right now. Here's the Kishi V2 Pro. At first glance, it looks identical to the Kishi V2. And finally, the Razer branded USB Type-C to Type-C cable. Okay, back to the Kishi version 2 Pro. Well, there you go, the first major difference, which is the inclusion of the 3.5mm jack. A quick look around of the Kishi V2 Pro, and yes, it looks like I got the right controller attachment. I mean, you just never know with Razer. 
Okay, back to the Edge tablet. We have some very specific instructions here. All right, let's free the edge from this plastic sleeve. And there you have it, the Razer Edge tablet. Okay, let's tour around the product, starting with the back of the tablet. You can see the Razer logo and the inflow and outflow vents. On the top of the tablet, we have the volume up and down and power buttons and the microphone. On the right side of the tablet, there is the USB Type-C port for data, charging, and video out, as well as one of the stereo speakers. On the bottom, we have an additional microphone and the micro SD tray. The 5G version uses an eSIM. On the left side, we have the other stereo speaker. Now let's take a look at the tablet with the Kishi V2 Pro all connected. On the left side of the controller, we have the switch style analog stick, and you can see that it sits above the face of the controller attachment. Next, we have the very clicky D-pad that may not appear to pivot well, but actually is very good at it. If you're not familiar with the Kishi V2, it's a really satisfying D-pad. Some face buttons, one of which is a dedicated screenshot and video capture. And there's that 3.5 millimeter jack on the bottom of the left side of the controller. Moving around to the top left side of the controller, we have the shoulder buttons in a stacked configuration with the additional third programmable button. The Kishi uses an analog trigger that has a good amount of travel and is very easy to press down on. These shoulder buttons have a nice satisfying clickiness and I can press down from any point. Now let's take a look at how the Kishi V2 Pro sits behind the tablet portion of the edge. Finally, moving on to the right side of the controller, now let's take a look at the face buttons, which are in an Xbox style ABXY configuration. The same nice clickiness is present here. You can see the buttons do not have a lot of travel. The best way to describe the feel and sound of these would be to compare them with a mouse click. Here's the right analog stick, the home and launcher button, and finally the Xbox style start button. On the bottom, we have the USB-C pass-through for charging only. This does not handle any data or video out. On the back of the Kishi, the grips have a very nice texture to them. Okay, let's turn this on for the first time and get things going. It looks like we have some Razer branded agreements and then finally a very common screen on my channel and this is just your standard Android setup process. Quickly going through this and it looks like we are ready to game and we are greeted with the Android home screen. So the device does not take you into any launcher. Quickly looking at what is pre-installed here and it looks fairly vanilla which is definitely a positive. Okay, we'll come back to Android shortly. Let's talk about the build quality, display, and sound on the Razer Edge. If you are familiar with the Kishi V2 attachment, the Razer Edge isn't really going to change your opinion all that much. It feels, as you would expect, similar to a phone docked with a Kishi. There isn't a whole lot of flexing across the entirety of the device, so it does establish a fairly strong grip. There is definitely a good amount of flexing on the left side. Nothing that is concerning, but if I really wanted to, I could probably break the left side off with some real strength. The tablet portion sits perfectly flush against the back of the Kishi attachment, and so compared to some phones, this would be an improvement. Overall, it does feel very nice in the hands. Alright, let's take off the attachment for a moment and check out the tablet on its own. There's no bending or flexing here, and everything feels very solid. The back has a smooth, matte black finish, and you can probably tell that it is unfortunately picking up on the oils in my skin, so you will probably be wiping this down a lot. The trim is finished with what feels like aluminum and is a nice touch. Let's talk about the display, which is a 144Hz AMOLED and has some really solid viewing angles, contrast, and is just a nice and bright display. Part of that display is unfortunately overshadowed by its large surrounding bezels, which feels out of date in 2023 and ironically is very reminiscent of the Razer Phone 2's issue when it was released. It's perhaps even more jarring when you combine the rounded display with a squared off rectangular tablet and the combination is just odd. Finally, I was very impressed by the punchy sound, and even when docked in the Kishi, it still comes off very loud. Here's a little sample of that. Alright, so now it's time to size up the Razer Edge against some familiar devices. First up is the popular retro handheld, the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus, which is about the size of the Razer Edge's tablet. Next, the Nintendo Switch, and you may or may not have noticed, but my Switch has undergone a bit of a color change thanks to my daughter secretly stealing my Joy-Cons. 
You can see that the edge is just a tiny bit wider, but not as tall as the Switch. Here's my AYN Odin Pro, which I believe is making an appearance for the first time ever on screen. The Steam Deck, which obviously is going to dwarf the Razer Edge in size. The Steam Deck is definitely a thick boy. It's been a few weeks since I've done my last in-depth review, so let's just make sure the scale is still working. Yep, all good. Here's the Odin Pro at about 360 grams, or about 13 ounces. The Nintendo Switch just shy of 14 ounces, or about 400 grams. The very light Retroid Pocket 3 Plus at 236 grams, or a little over 8 ounces. Finally, the Steam Deck at 1 pound 8 ounces, or 676 grams. So let's get the weight of the Razer Edge with the Kishi, which comes in at 384 grams, or about 13.5 ounces, making this one just a little lighter than a Nintendo Switch. So let's remove the Kishi and get the weight of the tablet on its own. The tablet comes in at under 9 ounces, or 248 grams, making it just a little heavier than a Retroid Pocket 3 Plus. Okay, so let's take some additional measurements using the digital caliper, checking out the size of the Kishi's face button, which comes in at about 7.6 millimeters, and the diameter of the analog sticks at about 14.5 millimeters. Compared to the Switch Joy-Cons, the face buttons are smaller at under 7 millimeters. However, the analog sticks are nearly identical in diameter. The Steam Deck face buttons at about 8.5 millimeters, which will be the largest here. Likewise, for the analog sticks coming in at over 15 and a half millimeters. The Odin Pro's face buttons are nearly identical to the Kishi size. However, its analog sticks are on the smaller side at around 13 and a half millimeters. Finally, the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus with the smallest face buttons at about 6.5 mm and the analog sticks at around 13.5 mm. So some thickness comparisons. The tablet portion of the edge comes in at about 10.5 mm with the Kishi attachment it's just under 20 mm. The Steam Deck is around 19 mm in thickness and finally the Odin Pro at about 15 mm in thickness. Lastly, here are the dimensions on screen for the Razer Edge. And one more measurement, and one that is becoming a tradition at this point, which is the pocket test. Now I've got my baggier than usual sweats on, and you can see that the complete edge package is just a little too much for even a bulkier pocket. And Sonny is clearly confused by his dad's choices here. Alright, so let's shift gears completely and head back into Android and talk about the included Razer software. What you see on screen right now is Razer Cortex, and at first glance it looks like I might have stumbled into a nightmare filled with gacha prizes, and it is definitely close to that. Within Cortex, you can earn rewards for free gift cards and lots of Razer swag if that's your thing. It also acts as a game launcher, and with it you can keep track of your playtime, but beyond some other features, I suspect this is a piece of software many will ignore on their device, myself included. Now let's hop on over to the Razer Nexus, and this is what would be considered the launcher for the Razer Edge. Unfortunately, in its current state, it's incredibly bare bones and, to put it nicely, a useless piece of software. You see, the idea with Razer Nexus is that you can use this as your hub to launch games and make use of the defining feature built into the Razer Edge, and that is the controller integration. Except that the version of Nexus that comes preloaded doesn't have any of the new features that Razer recently introduced to Nexus. So you can't actually use this piece of software to map controls at Android games that don't support it, so you can forget about Genshin Impact with a controller because in its current state, it's not happening. Now you can't even go into the Play Store to update the current version of Nexus because it won't even show up in the Play Store. However, that didn't stop me and I decided to silo the newest version, and while that does work, none of the features will work with the controller because the controller itself will need a firmware update, which according to a Razer product developer over on Reddit, should be coming soon. I guess we will have to wait and see because for a device that is positioned as the ultimate Android gaming handheld, the folks at Razer didn't find this feature to be that important to ship with. Furthermore, the Nexus software has no adjustments for the fan, performance settings, and it just feels like nobody at Razer has been paying attention to the state of Android gaming today, including the Chinese handhelds and all the gaming focused phones that are available now in which a lot of these software features come standard right out of the box. One last note in terms of software, the performance setting under battery in settings is not actually a performance mode. Instead, this is simply setting the CPU governor built into Android to performance. In fact, the Razer product developer that I have already referenced once from Reddit states that this should be kept off. Alright, it's now time for a mini teardown to confirm a few little things with the Razer Edge. Before prying off the back, I definitely recommend giving it a little heat around the edges to loosen that adhesive. 
The device is surprisingly very easy to get into, and I was able to use my trusty iFixit tool to pop the back cover off. Here's a nice look at the device with the back cover fully off. First thing we're going to check out here is that 5000 mAh battery, and obviously the other thing worth noting is that the battery is front and center and fairly easy to access, something I personally find very important. Alright, now I know this was something that a lot of people weren't sure about, so to confirm for my viewers here, the back cover is in fact made of plastic as you can see here. Okay, let's continue a little further as there are a few other things I want to check out. Right now, everything is using standard screws. Let's pop off the assembly and here is a close-up of the fan that allows the razor edge to have active cooling. So looking at the fan, it's designed to pull the airflow over the entirety of the motherboard from the bottom vent and push it out through the fan and the rear vent at the top. The fan itself is quite small, and for comparison I have a US dime, which is our smallest coin currency, and the fan itself is still a little smaller than that at around 17 millimeters. The battery has a built-in tab to use when needing to service it. Again, I'm pretty happy that this is easy to service. For this video, I will not be removing the battery. Okay, let's get all the connectors off here and try to get the motherboard out. There you have it, the Razer Edge motherboard covered in some uh, bubblegum thermal paste. Okay, time to clean everything off with some isopropyl alcohol since I will be replacing the stock thermal compound with some MX4. Don't worry, I did run benchmarks and take numbers before doing this. And everything is pretty nice and clean here. Okay, let's quickly disassemble one part of the Razer Kishi just to get a little peek at the differences between the regular version 2 and the Pro. We can also take a look at the haptics that is a new addition for the Kishi V2 Pro. Free shot, and there is your haptic motor. Okay, enough of this teardown stuff, let's get to the benchmarking. One of the biggest mysteries surrounding this device is the Snapdragon G3X Gen 1 chip that is included in this package. Now from articles in the past that talk about this specific chip, it seems that there is a 25% efficiency improvement and 30% GPU performance improvement over the Snapdragon 888. However, as the benchmarks that follow will show, many are left wondering, including myself, where Qualcomm are getting these numbers from. Now it's very possible that this is another marketing blunder just like the issue with the RAM, since when looking at Razer's own marketing for the Razer Edge, they never actually make those claims. Regardless, the numbers that follow put the G3X Gen 1 very much in line with something like the Snapdragon 888 Plus, which means that the performance improvement claims represented in the media coverage provided by Qualcomm doesn't make any sense. First, let's just pull up some information in CPU-Z, and you can see that this is listed as the Snapdragon 888 with that 5 nanometer FAB process, Cryo 680, and Adreno 660 graphics. Now, every tool I've used has this labeled as the Snapdragon 888 with the Adreno 660 graphics and a CPU clock speed of 3 GHz, which has me thinking that there's a good chance this is more of a repackaged Snapdragon 888 with overclocks applied, making it similar to a 888 Plus in performance. First up in our benchmarks is Geekbench 5 with some CPU performance. Now unfortunately I do not have a Snapdragon 888 or Snapdragon 888 Plus device on hand to test with, but I did pull numbers for the ASUS ROG 5S Pro which has the Snapdragon 888 Plus. Next you will see that I have included the GPD XP Plus which I do have on hand and can test with. The relevance of the GPD XP Plus is that prior to the Razer Edge being released, it was the most powerful dedicated Android gaming handheld. You can see how close the Razer Edge's numbers are to the Snapdragon 888 Plus, and despite the Dimensity 1200 in the XP Plus being a decent performer, the Razer Edge has a decent advantage over it. Next we have the 3D Mark Wildlife Test, and again the Razer Edge is very much in line with the Snapdragon 888 Plus in terms of performance. Again the Dimensity 1200 is falling behind in testing. Finally the Antutu Benchmark Suite, and we have a few sets of numbers here to discuss. 
Again, you can see that the overall numbers and CPU and GPU numbers of the Razer Edge are very close to that of the Snapdragon 888 Plus, with the Dimensity 1200 once again lagging in performance. Now if you recall during my teardown, I got to the thermal compound and replaced it with MX4. However, before doing that I ran baseline tests and the wildlife stress test which I had run for 20 minutes to determine the performance stability and see how much the SLC throttles after a certain amount of time. On the left, you can see the numbers for the stock performance of the Razer Edge. Stability is pretty good overall at 82.5% and you can see that the SLC is able to maintain most of its performance over the time span. After applying MX4 in my teardown, I wanted to test the effect of the active cooling in the Razer Edge, so I decided to completely unplug the fan and take it out of the Razer Edge. The numbers in the middle represent the wildlife stress testing for the Razer Edge without the fan installed and MX thermal compound applied. I think the chart and numbers speak for itself. Now you might say, well Rob, maybe it's just the MX4 that's not good enough. However, the numbers on the right represent the device with the Razer Edge's tiny fan reinstalled and it's quite apparent that the little fan that could is actually providing meaningful cooling to the Razer Edge allowing it to maintain the stability needed. One last thing worth noting is that the stock thermal compound is obviously of decent quality as the numbers between stock and the MX4 are nearly identical. Coming around to the temperature test, and I did not observe any surface temperature above 40 degrees Celsius, which is excellent. While the device can get warm, it never gets to the point that it feels too hot to touch. Please keep in mind that these are temperatures recorded as the stock device with the stock thermal compound. And finally, some battery testing. I conducted three separate battery tests with different variables. On the left side, I did a worst case scenario test with max brightness, max volume, 120Hz refresh, and Wi-Fi on with Shadow of the Colossus and Ether SX2. As you can see, the device lasted about 2 hours and 10 minutes. On the right side, I used Shadow of the Colossus again, but this time I set the brightness to 50%, the volume to 50%, Wi-Fi turned off, and 60Hz refresh, and was able to get just under 3 hours with 2 hours and 52 minutes. Finally, a lighter test using the Super Nintendo version of Yoshi's Island with 50% brightness, 50% volume, no Wi-Fi, and 60Hz refresh, and it was able to achieve almost 11 and a half hours. In terms of charging performance, the Edge took around 1 hour to charge from 0% to 100% when directly connected to the tablet. Unfortunately, charging will be much slower when leaving the Kishi connected to the device as it is limited to just 12 watts versus the 33 watts when connected directly to the tablet. Finally, I wanted to test battery drain when the device is on standby overnight. Now being a Kishi version 2 owner for some time now, I know that the Kishi drains phone batteries from experience and so I was curious to see how the V2 Pro fares with the tablet part of the Razer Edge. With the Kishi attachment on, I noted about a 12% drop overnight or about 2% per hour, which is a pretty significant drain. Without the Kishi attachment, I observed only a 1% drop overnight, which was over the course of about 6-7 to seven hours. So if this is meant to be the ultimate handheld, then why is it that the battery drains more than 10 times faster with the controller attached? This is definitely an inconvenience for someone that is obviously buying this to use as a dedicated Android handheld, as they will most likely leave the Kishi attachment on the device. Now you could definitely just power off the device, but I'm hoping this is something that Razer can address, and I did see that the Razer product developer claims that they are trying to address this issue. Okay, time for a much needed stretch and break. Say hello to Sunny again, and go give your pets some hugs please. Now it's time for some native Android gaming. Let's kick things off with a game that I've been wanting to feature on the channel, and that is the awesome racing game Wreckfest, which is a fantastic port to the Android platform. As you can see here, the game runs great, and I have this one on high settings. Moving on to Diablo Immortal, and the same thing goes for this one, with the Edge having no issues running this one on high settings. Here's an interesting port to Android and a very fun and unique take on Dragon Quest. This port apparently is pretty difficult to run and requires a decent device, so I thought it was a good game to test the Edge's ability to play harder games. As you can see here, the game has no issues running, and this one is one that looks particularly good with that vivid AMOLED display.
Here's a little bit of Fortnite, and to no one's surprise, the game is very smooth here. Now with that 144Hz display, we could either choose to run this game at 90 frames per second, or bump the settings up and stick to 60 frames per second. Either way, the game does run well on the Razer Edge. One last game to test out, and normally I would showcase Genshin Impact in place of Tower of Fantasy. However, Tower of Fantasy does have native controller support, and this is easily the best performance I've seen with Tower of Fantasy on the Android devices that I personally own. Finally, let's get to some emulation testing and probably something that a lot of my viewers will be very interested in. Let's kick things off with PlayStation 2, which will be one of the key systems that the Razer Edge will have no issues handling. The GPD XP Plus was already a pretty solid performer with PS2, but I fully expect the Razer Edge to blow it away. By the way, all the PlayStation 2 games being shown here are using the NTSC version with no performance hacks enabled. First up, we have one of the harder to emulate games on PS2 and Android. Shadow of the Colossus is running very stable at two times native resolution. I played through to the first Colossi and the Edge had no issues with it at all. Next up is another fairly hard to emulate game with Burnout 3, and as many know this is one of my absolute favorite racing games on the PlayStation 2. With this one we could take things a little higher and run it very stable at 2.5 times native resolution. Really nice performance with this one. But we're not done yet. Here is yet again another difficult game to emulate, and I was very shocked by the results, but I have Black, which is an awesome and overlooked first-person shooter from Criterion, the studio behind Burnout, running at four times native resolution. The game just looks absolutely amazing here. Finally, one last game running at four times native resolution with some Devil May Cry 3. Okay, let's switch on over to Nintendo Land and check out F-Zero on the GameCube using Dolphin. I've got this one running on one of the more difficult tracks to emulate smoothly at two times native resolution, and you can see that it is incredibly smooth. I was almost able to get this one running at three times native resolution, but just not quite there. Moving on with some more Dolphin emulation and checking out Super Mario Galaxy 2 for the Wii, and here I have it running at 2 times native resolution, and as you can see here, it is very smooth. This game in particular looks absolutely incredible on the AMOLED display and cleans up so nicely.
Next up, we have Super Mario 3D Land in Citra at three times native resolution, and it's another one that the Razor Edge has no issues with. I'm pretty sure I mentioned it for the GPD XP Plus, but if there's a solid use case for a ultra wide display, I think 3D emulation is it, as the ultra wide aspect ratio is really awesome for 3DS emulation, as you can see here. Finally, an emulator that is in such rapid development and literally had a new version released while I was working on this video. Skyline and the paid Patreon version Skyline Edge is one that I was very excited about trying on the Razer Edge as I knew I would be able to open up more of the Switch library with that Snapdragon SLC. I'm very excited to keep watching this one develop more and I think we're only going to see more improvements which makes it exciting for the Razer Edge. Up first is a game that I couldn't quite run at full speed on the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus, and here I have Bastion running with those custom adrenal drivers, which again helps with compatibility and performance. Just like that, the Bastion comes alive. Starts growing again, growing stronger. Kids gotta put its power to good use. Now the Bastion can send him even farther into the wild unknown. Next up is a personal favorite of mine and an indie darling. Fez is running super smooth here with Skyline and on the Razor Edge. Finally, I was so excited this one is running as well as it is since my daughter and me absolutely love Untitled Goose Game. The game has a minor graphical issue, but other than that, it is really smooth and very playable. Now what's exciting about Skyline Emulator is that I've tested a lot of other games and I'm just blown away by how much more I can play with it compared to something like the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus. The Snapdragon SLC definitely has more support and compatibility and so again I'm very excited to keep tracking the progress of Skyline and possibly do an emulation showcase in the future. Here is some cloud game streaming with Xbox Cloud and I didn't really have any issues with this. The Razer Edge is equipped with Wi-Fi 6E and so is a good performer for game streaming. The Kishi's analog triggers and overall setup makes it good for Xbox and PlayStation remote play compared to some other Android handhelds. For PC streaming, you can make use of the Razer Edge's ultra wide display and set your PC content to take advantage of it, making it a really nice way to do PC game streaming. I wanted to briefly talk about using the Razer Edge as just as a small tablet, and surprisingly, I'm finding myself really liking it just as a tablet. First off, there are a lot of games that are just a blast to play that just simply wouldn't work with traditional controls, and so it's cool to have a small tablet-like device to play these games. Now, I have some other interesting ideas planned for the tablet mode, so stay tuned to my channel to see what crazy ideas I'm cooking up. Finally, one last area I wanted to touch upon before wrapping up this video. I tested the HDMI out over USB-C, and while it does work fairly well, there are obvious issues with it. The biggest one being that there is no way to turn the display off and only have it display on the output, which is a common setting found on Android handhelds such as the Odin Pro here. Now I have my trusty 8-bit Doe Bluetooth controller connected to the Razer Edge, and while this setup is pretty nice, you can see that the Edge also mirrors its 20 by 9 aspect ratio. So on my portable monitor with a 16 by 10 aspect ratio, you can see that I am getting black bars on the top and bottom, and so I thought this was worth demonstrating for this video. Wow, this device has been far more interesting than I ever expected it to be. From the drama surrounding the missing RAM, the mysterious Snapdragon G3X that seems more like a rebadge than a new SLC purpose-built for gaming, the reality is that my hesitation from my Razer Phone 2 retrospective turned out to have some bearing post Razer Edge launch. On one hand, there are things I like about this device, and I have enjoyed using it with its excellent performance that has allowed me to push the boundaries of Android emulation further. On the other hand, and I feel this will hold 
true for most. One quick look at the edge, and you start to wonder what its use case is exactly. In many ways, the GBD XP Plus that I covered a few months ago has the same use case issue. For the most part, it's basically what one would expect, a Razer Kishi V2 that has been attached to a phone-like device, which is not a new concept and something that many already do with their mobile device. So it comes down to whether or not you are looking for a solid performer that you can keep as a dedicated Android handheld. Now I wouldn't quite call the Razer Edge the ultimate Android gaming handheld as Razer would have you believe. Instead, I do think that it's a solid value for what you get at $399, and you would be hard pressed to find a better value independently in the Android world. The Kishi V2 Pro is exclusively part of the Razer Edge bundle, and Razer apparently does have plans to sell it separately in the near future at a rumored price of $150. Now looking around at new or secondhand devices with the performance of a Snapdragon AAA Plus, and you start to realize the package being offered here is, as I said earlier, a good value. Now moving on up to the Razer Edge 5G, and the value starts to get lost. For $200 more, you do get that extra 2GB of RAM, but outside of that, and the inclusion of the 5G support, the package becomes much less of a value. Since at $599 US dollars, you are starting to enter the territory of powerhouse phones like the upcoming Red Magic 8 Pro. Pro, which at the time of publishing will be going up for sale, and if you hopped on the early bird offer, could be purchased for as little as 619 US dollars. As always, and what seems to be a recurring theme in this world of handhelds, is the search for the perfect device. But the reality is that no such device needs to exist, as what works for one might not work for someone else. We are truly lucky to have so many options, and with that, I leave you to make the decision that works best for you, because at the end of the day, the best choice is the one that you make for yourself. Thank you so much for coming by and watching this in-depth look at the Razer Edge. Now that I have the Razer Edge, I no longer have a need for this Razer Kishi V2, and so I definitely need to make some room here because I'm starting to get buried with controller attachments and handhelds. Instead of simply selling this off, I decided to host another giveaway and let someone else have the chance to turn their Android device into a handheld, which as many of my viewers know is something that I am a big supporter of. To enter the giveaway, simply like this video, comment down below with your thoughts about the Razer Edge, and subscribe to my channel. The giveaway giveaway will run for 7 days at which point I will contact the winner and then make an announcement on any applicable social media platforms. To the eventual winner and any new subscribers, I hope you stick around and thank you for giving this video and my channel your time. This is the Retro Tech Dad and as always, I thank you so much for watching.